with People Pets, and I'm here with Jeff Watson today, who is a bear trainer. Handler. Handler, bear handler, who is a show on Animal Planet called Project Grizzly. Why don't you tell us a bit about it? There's an interesting story behind it. Yeah, I've had bears for 28 years, and I have done a lot of training for mm -hmm. commercials, TV shows, a lot of educational programs telling people how to be safe around bears, how to survive an encounter if they have one, how to avoid an encounter. But Project Grizzly is about taking two captive-born, captive-raised brown bears, excuse me, and seeing if I can release them into the wild. And going into it, I didn't know uh, what instincts they possessed, mm -hmm. and if they knew how to dig a den, if they knew how to forage for food, uh, what I had to teach them, and what would just come out naturally. So the whole objective of this project is to take them out there and get them prepared in a uh, bear boot camp, if, if you will, <laughs> so they can go out on their own. And without giving too much away, what are some of the things that uh, captive bears would need to learn to be released into the wild? And how would you teach them that? Well, again, I don't want to give away right. what I had to teach them and what they, they right. learned on their own, but I can tell you they do need to know how to den up. Uh, black bears oftentimes will den in an existing den, go underneath a brush pile. Okay. Brown bears usually dig their den. And there's exceptions to that. They may find a, a cave or something, but usually they need to dig. And I didn't know if they would dig. Right. And you don't know until no, you watch I don't the whole know. show. Um, and I, I want to make sure they could fish on their own. Right. These are animals that had their food delivered to them. You know, they had mills on wheels for years. Yeah. So I wanted them to work for a living. Right. I wanted to see if they knew which uh, what vegetation uh, they could eat and uh, if they knew that instinctively. And what inspired you to try to release these animals into the wild? Well, having the bears and training the bears wasn't really my interest as far as the training. Having them, interacting with them right. has always been my interest. But to facilitate feeding bears and, uh, and keeping the lights on, I married a hobby with a profession. So, uh, but from the beginning, I just wanted to hang out with them. <laughs> and I had hauled some bears out of uh, Montana. The mother had been killed by the state because she broke into tack buildings. And, and bears have a, a very acute homing instinct. So if they have to relocate them, they normally come back. And in some areas, if it's three strikes, you're out. You keep coming back, we're, that's it. We remove you from the population. So this female was, uh, was uh, euthanized and the cubs were taken into captivity. I picked them up for a zoo in northern Indiana. And that was back 11 years ago. And at that time, it just kind of reinforced what I wanted to do uh, all along. That was take bears to the wild. And right. here I'm taking them out, but they, they, I had no choice in the right. matter. So I just transported them to the zoo and they're doing well. I mean, you've got a lot of bears in New York City that are doing well at the zoos, and, they can, and these were out of the wild. But personally, I just wanted to see if I could take captive-born bears. Uh, there was a famous bear trainer who lost a bear 15, 16 years ago. His wife had written a poem after this bear died saying, his eyes always long for the wild. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know if they really long for the wild, but I, inside you feel as though they may. Yeah, you might want to try. Right, and it doesn't mean the wild is a easier life. No. I mean, again, they've been pampered for years. Nobody's been trying to hunt them. Uh, they're not going to starve to death at my place. <laughs> and uh, they get medical and, and dental. I mean, that's the law. I have a federal license like any zoo has. So mm -hmm. the USDA's Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, you know, they uh, enforce the Animal Welfare Act. So they come to my facility uh, unannounced, like they do every zoo in the country. So they don't get that in the wild. And mortality rates are high in the wild. So it, it's... It's a natural thing, but is it a good thing? Right. Um, there's not a lot of habitat out there for people and animals to share anymore. Or, so it's something I wanted to do, but I'll, I'll get some criticism from both sides. Some will get upset that you have the bears in the first place, and you go, okay, well, I'll try to teach them to live on their own. And, well, you're not going to let them go, are you? <laughs> Somebody's going to shoot them. It's like, well, what do you want? Yeah, i got to do something. Right. So, But it's something that is a personal goal of mine, and, and uh, I just want to see if it can be done. That's great. Well, I'm interested to watch and see what happens. And so... Obviously, bear handler is not an occupation that you hear very often, or at least I hear very often. Right. How did you, you say it was a passion of yours, how did you come into this role? I got my first bear in my early 20s, 1988, and uh, I'd had a disease called Guillain-Barre, which is a neurological disease, mm -hmm. and very similar to uh, multiple sclerosis. They think now that, that uh, uh, President Roosevelt may have had Guillain-Barre as opposed to polio. Um, but anyway, I, I had learned how to walk again at age 20, and it kind of changed wow. my way of thinking. Yeah. So I went from being a pretty athletic guy to you know being paralyzed. When I got back on my feet, uh, I had an opportunity to get a bear cub. Uh, somebody had one, and I wanted it, and I got it, and I just wanted to hang out in the woods with it. And to me, that was kind of a, you know, just, I don't know, therapy. 
I thought, but I probably needed therapy going into it, not realizing that uh, it's a bear. You know, I watched Grizzly Adams, which was an old movie that came out in 74 and a TV series in 77 and 78 about, it was a fictionalized account of a historical character, a guy okay. named John Adams, who was from the East Coast, went to California during the gold rush, started, uh, he shot some bears, but he raised a lot of cubs. And uh, he lived in the Sierra Nevada with them, and lived in the, in the Rockies with them. And I wanted to do that. But when I grew up watching this, the network didn't tell me that that's, that's how this man died. Bears, are, you know, were his demise. So I grew up with all these, you know, because misconceptions. You're gonna raise bears yeah, like I'm just going to live with them, treat them good, and they'll never try to hurt me. But that's not the way. That's not the way it is. They're dangerous animals. So that was the. I think that was the real impetus behind me, you know, wanting to to hang out with them. So I got my first bear, and people wanted to see it, and I thought, well, how can I? mix the two, right. a hobby and, and a profession. And the training, like I said, training for commercials and TV shows, that's never really been my passion. It's it's paid the bills. And my type of training, I'm not slamming anybody else's way of training, but my thing was natural behaviors. Same thing zoos do now, teach right. a bear to open his mouth. Well, they open their mouths, that's how they eat. <laughs> so if you want a bear to open his mouth like he's roaring, you just give him a little hand signal, give him a food reinforcement. And zoos will do that to check their teeth and check the, you know, just the health of their mouth. Uh, if they want them to stand up so they can do an inspection. So it's all operant conditioning, real right. basic stuff. So it's not like I'm having them ride a bicycle. It's say you're not training them to wear a bow tie and get on a unicycle no, or no, anything. No, 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 it's straight ties. I don't need <laughs> bow ties. And so after all your time that you've spent with bears, what are some misconceptions that you feel people have about these animals? Well, I mean, people have uh, one of two opinions, I think. It goes okay. to the extreme. Cute, cuddly teddy bear, or a bloodthirsty man-eater. And I'm guessing neither of those extremes is 100%. Right? Exactly, not, not 100%. I mean, you get a rogue bear. You'll get a bear that, that, that may uh, hunt people down. That's rare, but it may be an injured bear, may have a bad tooth, who knows what's wrong with it. Uh, generally speaking, bears want to avoid people more than people want to avoid bears. People go out to the, the national parks hoping to see a bear. The bears just want to be left alone. And if you surprise a bear, and it doesn't have a chance to leave, then that's a sudden encounter. Let's right. say you're walking in Yellowstone Park and a bear has uh, bedded down because it's a windy day. They don't hear so well on windy days. They bed down. They don't hear you coming. You step right next to it, and maybe it has a cub or it has a food uh, source here, and it perceives you now as a threat. They didn't have a chance to leave. That's a sudden encounter, and during sudden encounters, grizzlies oftentimes try to re uh, remove what they think is the threat. And that's to try to kill you. They go all Leonardo DiCaprio mm -hmm. on you, you know? And uh, you want to play dead in a situation with a grizzly like that. You're trying to tell that animal with your body language, gotta... I'm no threat to you. But I don't want to give too much on the safety of, uh, of uh, what you do with a bear because it depends on the type of bear that it is. If it's a black bear, if it's a brown bear, what type of uh, encounter that it is. Uh, uh, is it a sudden encounter? Is it a predatory encounter where the animal comes to you? And that's something people need to really research on their own before they go into bear country. Right. So that's what you would recommend if you're about to go into an area where you know there are wild bears. Yeah, and the thing is, if you're going into bear country, um, in, in the lower 48, there's only four states that have brown bears, okay. grizzlies. That'd be Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, and Washington State. So okay. if you're going anywhere else, no grizzlies, just research what you have to do with a black bear. And, and statistically, you're safe with all bears. Um, you know, you have a greater chance of being struck by lightning in, in a national park or being stung by bees mm -hmm. uh, or, or beat up by just another human. <laughs> But um, you still want to be able to be prepared. Now, grizzlies and black bears are different animals. Mm -hmm. That's why we tolerate so many black bears in the lower 48 as opposed to the grizzlies. At one time, we had 10,000 grizzlies, an estimated 10,000 grizzlies in California alone. Wow. They killed the last one in 1922. Uh, still have one on the flag and at the zoos, but that's about it. Uh, the lower 48 had 50 to 100,000 estimated grizzlies. So. We, we eliminated most of those, probably down to 1,500 or so. So there's a reason for that. They're not as user friendly. They don't forgive our mistakes like the black bear does. You surprise a grizzly, you have a far greater chance of being mauled than you do if you surprise a black bear. But, um, you know, you have to research it on your own because I don't want to get sued. Right. I, I, I did what you told me to do. No, bears don't read the literature, right. so you get the exception every now and then. Um. So how can people, <coughs> when talking about declining numbers, protect these animals and what can they do to make sure that the bears we have 
do stay safe. Well, they're still going to hunt bear. Right. I mean, bears are going to die. That's all there is to it. Um, uh, there's just not enough habitat, and habitat's fragmented. Uh, there are bears that are problem bears that are destroyed or placed in captivity. The best thing a person can do, excuse me, is make sure that they don't habituate the bears. They don't let the bears become familiar with people and comfortable around people. And the best way to do that is to keep clean campsites. So if you go camping, make sure that you don't leave a lot of food around because the bears can come in and, and associate people with food. That's a food condition bear. Now they've lost their fear of people because they're getting close to you. And they're and, getting food because of it. Right, so food condition and habituation are reasons why a lot of bears have to be destroyed or placed into captivity. And that's something that we can do as an individual uh, to, to, or we can do as individuals to just help bears. Great. And then just uh, as a wrap up, can you tell us once again what your show is about and where people can watch it? It's about and kangaroos <laughs> and it's on animal. No, it's about grizzly bears. It's called Project Grizzly. Uh, you can watch it on Saturday nights, 10 o'clock Eastern, I believe. Um, and it's On Animal Planet? Animal Planet, yes. Great. And, uh, well, I look forward to watching it. And Jeff, I want to thank you so much for coming in and sharing your story with us. And uh, I look forward to learning more. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you.